Ever since electric circuit engineering was kick-started by the invention of the battery in 1800, circuit technology has advanced exponentially and will certainly continue to deliver more wonders for the world. None of this would have been possible without Ohm's law, one of the first physical laws of electric circuits ever written down. Ohm's law allows the ratio of voltage and current in a circuit to be determined by the impedance of a circuit. So naturally, scientists and engineers have worked hard to understand what the impedance of their circuits are. This video is about how to describe the impedance of electric circuits using continued fractions. A continued fraction is not a math concept typically taught in engineering school, but it can be enormously helpful in calculating the impedance of electric circuits. To start, let's look at two circuit elements connected in series. Each element can be quantified as a real or complex number, depending on the type of system the circuit is connected to. The total impedance is just the sum of the impedance of the two elements. This is generally called the total equivalent impedance, but for short, I'll just say total impedance for the rest of the video. To find the total impedance of two elements connected in parallel, the reciprocal of the two impedances are added together, and then the inverse of that sum gives the total impedance. Combining these two types of circuits together gives a total impedance formula that looks like a combination of the previous two formulas. Adding a series connection is straightforward using the same rules, and now resembles a type of circuit called a ladder network. Adding one more link into the ladder network and constructing the total impedance formula reveals a, a structure called a continued fraction. This type of fraction provides a template for quickly calculating the total impedance of many series and parallel connections. A notable example is a ladder network with all impedances equal to the same value, which I will call Z. The first segment of this ladder gives a total impedance of 2Z. The total impedance for two segments is 5Z over 3, 3 segments adds to 13Z over 8, and 4 segments is 34Z over 21. These numbers may appear familiar to some because they're the Fibonacci numbers. Fibonacci numbers have a special property in that each Fibonacci number is the sum of the previous two Fibonacci numbers. Extending this network out to infinity repeats the pattern in the fraction. Pulling a z out of the fraction leaves a 1 for every term inside the fraction. This infinite continued fraction is well known and happens to be equal to 1 plus the square root of 5 all over 2, which is also known as the golden ratio. More can be learned from a ladder network with four different segments that repeat infinite times. The continued fraction also extends an infinite number of levels. Since removing 1 from infinity is still infinity, the repeating segment can be considered the same as the total. The total impedance can then be inserted where the circuit starts to repeat, and the continued fraction now has a finite number of terms. Starting at this point, and for the rest of the video, it helps to pause and watch things slowly and carefully in order to keep track of what's going on. The fraction can now be collapsed one level at a time starting at the bottom and continuing until there is just a single numerator and denominator. Rearranging these terms gives a quadratic equation with the total impedance as the variable. In this form, the quadratic formula can be used to find the total impedance for the entire infinite circuit. This method can be used to find the total impedance for any repeating infinite ladder network and approximates the impedance for ladder networks that are finite but repeat many times. The ladder network with just two different elements is more straightforward to solve. The first step is to pull the square root of the product of the two impedances out of the fraction. This leaves a series of terms inside the fraction that are all the same. This form of continued fraction is similar to the golden ratio we saw earlier as well as the other metallic ratios, which all have the same term in each step of the fraction. In general, if each term in the fraction is n, then the entire fraction is equal to n plus the square root of n squared plus 4 all over 2. This is the result of the quadratic formula derived in the last scene. Plugging this relationship back into the example at hand allows the continued fraction to be collapsed into just a few terms. Then multiplying the terms produces the final form of the solution to this example. Now I want to show an example that's a little more random and more alike to a real world problem. Each of these impedances could represent any type of electrical load, like a light bulb, a hair dryer, or even an electric car. Anything works. The circuit is finite and doesn't have a repeating structure, but a continued fraction can still be constructed. First, the branch from Z5 to Z9 can be combined into series and parallel terms like before, 
and the same goes for the Z2 to Z4 terms. These two groups are connected in parallel to each other, so summing them requires adding their inverses. Finally, the Z1 term is added in series. Up to this point, I've treated the Z terms as general variables. Now, I'd like to get more specific and look at impedances with imaginary values. A common example of this type of circuit is an alternating current network with series connected inductors and parallel connected capacitors. Here, the impedance depends on four values. The I term represents the imaginary unit, the square root of minus one. The omega term is associated with the AC frequency, such as the 50 hertz or 60 hertz used in power grids around the world. L is the inductance and is associated with the ability of the inductor to create a magnetic field when current flows through it. C is the capacitance and is associated with the ability of the capacitor to create an electric field when voltage is applied. The resulting continued fraction has a similar pattern as the previous example with just two different impedances repeating forever. So the same steps are applied as before and now every level of the fraction has the same term. I'll rename some of these terms to change how we look at this example. The root LC term is the inverse of the resonant frequency of the system. The resonant frequency determines what frequencies will cause the system to behave like an open or short circuit, which is important in many engineering fields. The term pulled outside the fraction is known as the characteristic impedance of the network and acts like a scaling factor for the whole equation. Finally, using the fact that the square of the imaginary unit is minus one, the I term in the fraction can be pulled out, but this leaves negative signs on every other term inside the fraction. Now is a good time to look at how these fractions evolve as each branch of the ladder is added. Using the current example with just one branch in the ladder, the total impedance gives a fraction of polynomials with frequency as the variable. A ladder with two branches gives another complicated fraction of polynomials, and adding more branches gives longer and longer polynomials with seemingly random coefficients. But these coefficients are not random. They come directly from Pascal's triangle. Looking across the diagonals of Pascal's triangle provides the coefficients that appear in the terms of the collapsed fractions. If the coefficients in each polynomial are added, the Fibonacci numbers are recovered, like in the very first example. If all the impedances are the same value and positive, then these polynomials all collapse into Fibonacci numbers. These functions display interesting behavior when graphed. I'm going to graph the third example here, which I've highlighted in red. On this chart, we're looking at how the absolute value of the total impedance changes based on the system frequency. The best place to start is by setting the inductance, L, and the capacitance, C, both equal to one. I'll decrease and increase C, which will change the resonant frequency and characteristic impedance. Look for patterns in how the impedance curve behaves as the resonant frequency and characteristic impedance change. The value of the resonant frequency stretches or shrinks the curve along the frequency axis, which changes the locations of the roots and poles, or the places where the impedance equals zero or infinity. The value of the characteristic impedance stretches or shrinks the curve along the impedance axis, but doesn't affect the location of the roots or poles. Ultimately, changing C alone creates an inversely proportional change to both the resonant frequency and characteristic impedance. Now, I'll decrease and increase just the inductance, L, to see its effects on the impedance curve. Just like capacitance, changes in inductance create inversely proportional changes to the resonant frequency, but opposite to capacitance, changing inductance up or down changes the characteristic impedance in the same direction. In this scene, I'll adjust the values of inductance and capacitance in the same way, increasing or decreasing the values together. Note that the characteristic impedance doesn't change, but resonant frequency does. The impedance curve only shrinks or stretches along the frequency axis. Now, I'll shift the inductance and capacitance values in opposite directions. Note that when the inductance is high and the capacitance is low, the curve rises steeply between the roots and poles. When the capacitance is high but the inductance is low, the curve is very flat between the poles. These last four scenes show all the ways to vary L and C relative to each other, and I think this is a good place to stop. I'll leave a link to this calculator in the description in case anyone wants to play around with it. 
I'd love to hear if anyone found this an easier way to find total impedance. So if you try it out, please leave a comment and let me know what you think. Thanks for watching.